Hey guys, so uh, I'm going to talk to you today about graphene transistors. Um, okay, let's get to it. So I'm going to start by quickly reviewing uh, what a transistor is. Uh, so a transistor is a semiconductor device that either amplifies a signal or it can be used as a switch. Uh, it's an active device. Uh, and they're critical for integrated circuits that either use RF signals or um, are made of logic gates. So a quick history of the transistor. Um, as we've talked about in class, the, tra uh, the field effect transistor was first patented by Julius Lillenfeld uh, in 1926. Unfortunately, he didn't have the means to fabricate this at the time, but the, he proposed it. And then in 1947, um, three engineers at Bell Labs had built the point contact transistor, and they successfully patented that. Um, and a year later in Germany, uh, Herbert Matare and Heinrich Welker had independently developed their own transistor, uh, their point contact transistor. Um, and then a few years later at Bell Labs, they had developed the first working silicon transistor. Uh, and later that year, the first commercial silicon transistor was produced and sold by Texas Instruments. Again, later that year, uh, Dewan Kong and Martin Atala invented the first MOSFET transistor and were able to fabricate it after um, 25 years. So in between the first MOSFET transistor uh, and the present day, um, we have, in accordance with Moore's law, have been able to more efficiently produce transistors, um, reducing their size and energy consumption and being able to fit more in the same um, square area. So you can see in the blue line here uh, that the number of transistors has dramatically increased since the early 70s. And um, corresponding with that, the length of the MOSFET gate uh, has been decreasing, which is shown in red. So now that I've given a quick history of transistors, I'm going to start talking about graphene itself. So what is graphene? Graphene is a one atom layer of carbon atoms in a 2D hexagonal lattice. Uh, graphene has a lot of mechanical and thermal properties, but the relevant properties for making a transistor are the fact that it has a strong electric field effect and a very high carrier mobility, similar to that of a metal. So graphene, an infinite graphene 2D lattice actually has a band gap of zero. But as you can see in the GIF here, if you restrict the uh, lattice to a finite length and actually decrease the length, you create what are called nano ribbons. And these nano ribbons, uh, depending on the shape and the length of the edge, um, what can be called an armchair or a zigzag pattern, you get various uh, momentum curves. As we know from class, these momentum curves uh, show the band gap. So by creating these nano ribbons of varying lengths, we're able to tune the band gap of graphene between roughly 0 and 0.25 electron volts. So graphene was first proposed by Philip Russell Wallace, who discussed it hypothetically in 1946. Later, in 1962, Han Peter Bohm described a layer of carbon foil that he was able to create by reducing the graphite oxide chemically. In 2004, Andre Geem and Kostya Novoslev cleaved a sheet of graphene from graphite and were able to study its electronic properties. After they had published this paper, interest in graphene skyrocketed as a potential material for semiconductors. In 2008, Tung et al. demonstrated better production methods of graphene, and in 2010, Geem and Novoslev were actually awarded a Nobel Prize for their work. In 2013, graphene was shown to be able to be grown using more advanced chemical vapor deposition models methods. So graphene at scale can be produced in two main ways. It can be grown on met metals and transferred to insulating substrates, or it can be created through the thermal decomposition of silicon carbon. So as a review from class, a MOSFET transistor is a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. It's comprised of the source, the drain, the substrate, the oppositely doped substrate, the gate oxide, and the gate. As we know, in order to operate this, you apply a voltage on the gate and are able to create an inversion layer of carriers below the oxide that are able to join the source and drain and allow carriers to flow between them, completing the circuit. When used in uh, logic gates, MOSFETs or different types of MOSFETs, P and N types, are combined in various combinations to create CMOS uh, logic gates. The reason we like to use silicon to create CMOS gates are that this, the off state of the transistor has incredibly low power usage as compared to the on state when current is flowing. The ratio between the two is on the order of 10 to the 4th, between 10 to the 4th and 10 to the 7th. For logic gate applications of transistors, 
this ratio is very important so that we don't use a lot of power. However, this isn't completely necessary for RF uh, applications. So applying graphene transistors to the MOSFET. You can see here that the graphene is connecting the source and the drain. This is one of the most widely studied configurations of a graphene MOSFET. And you can deposit a dielectric layer on top of a device to get a top gate configuration. This allows both the top gate and the back gate to control the biases and control the charge concentration that exists in the device channel. Usually, the MOSFETs that we've looked at in class, we actually um, ground the substrate, but if the substrate is connected to a separate voltage source, you're able to more finely tune the charge concentrations that are present in the MOSFET. One of the key differences here between a graphene transistor and a semiconductor transistor are that a graphene transistor allows us to, have, because of its high mobility, um, it's, it allows us to make, create a much shorter gate that also reacts a lot quicker. One of the drawbacks to this, however, is that graphene transistors have a very low ratio for the I of the current that's while it's on and the current while it's off. This makes them a poor choice f to be used for logic gates. However, their high frequencies, which can reach as far as 350 gigahertz, make them very useful for RF circuits. An alternative configuration for a graphene transistor is shown here on the right. By decomposing the silicon carbon, you create a thin layer of graphene on top of the substrate that a dielectric is then put on top of. Again, the band gap of graphene is the main problem here in uh, the ratio between the current when it's on and off and being able to switch off the transistor. We can try to mitigate this by lowering the width of the nano ribbons that are present in the graphene. However, the way that we do this typically results in nano ribbons that have uneven edges, which then cause the momentum curve of the graphene to shift, which increases the effective mass. As we know from class, an increase in effective mass lowers the mobility, which erodes one of the main advantages to having a graphene transistor in the first place. So one of the more interesting recent developments in graphene transistors is the introduction of a bilayer graphene transistor. Now, as the name suggests, a bilayer graphene transistor uses bilayer graphene, which is just two layers of graphene sandwiched on top of each other. The carbon atoms in the graphene have the pi orbitals, or the electrons have pi orbitals that interact with each other uh, and produce some interesting electrostatics. So we found that if you apply an electric field, as you can see on this graph, you can actually increase the band gap of, of graphene um, to a non-zero value. As you can see in this figure, um, by increasing the, you could, this is the shape that the band gap takes when you apply an electric field. Unfortunately, however, we found that the electric field that's required to power this um, band gap isn't always practical and makes bilayer graphene transistors still a bit of a stretch to be used for logic transistors. It requires a pretty high electric field to create a sizable band gap significant enough to have a reasonable um, on current and off current ratio. In addition, the dielectric uh, that we'd need to deposit onto the transistor itself in order to support such a high field um, is very hard to fabricate and attach directly to a graphene layer. So as I've said before, there are a few implementation challenges with uh, the development of graphene transistors. So the manufacturing of graphene is still quite underdeveloped. The technology is only roughly 12 years old um, and new, more efficient methods are still being researched. In addition, uh, the band gap issues with the graphene um, will continue to be an issue for logic circuits especially because switching the transistor off entirely depends on the band gap of, of the graphene. So navigating this trade-off between the band gap and the mobility um, when you're reducing the size of the nano ribbons or expending extra energy to get a bilayer uh, graphene transistor to work um, will be something that we have to continue to face. If the material um, inherent issues are solved with graphene, we should be able to manufacture them uh, quite easily because the standard uh, CMOS fab techniques will work on graphene after it has been deposited onto a substrate. So some likely and future applications of graphene transistors are probably going to be to replace most traditional semiconductors in most um, radio frequency applications. And despite the fact that graphene doesn't have much of a band gap under most circumstances uh, and consequently has a very low ratio between the current when the transistor is on and the current when the transistor is off, the, dramatic, the high speed of the carriers and the high mobility in graphene um, makes it a very attractive 
uh, material to be used in radio frequency applications. Um, the carrier transport in graphene is actually two times as fast as gallium arsenide and four times as fast as silicon. So this could dramatically improve a lot of wireless communication that is used in most of our day-to-day -day life. Um, in addition, the high efficiency of graphene as a carrier, um, in terms of its carriers, could have the potential to result in flexible thin transistors, which would be used in anything from touch screens to more um, pliable electronics such as foldable e paper or maybe even foldable OLEDs. Uh, the likelihood that we'll see graphene really replace most mainstream semiconductors in a logic transistor is pretty low um, unless there's some kind of breakthrough with the band gap manipulation of graphene uh, that's pretty unlikely to happen. Uh, thanks for listening. I uh, hope you learned something interesting today and thanks a lot. Thanks again. Um, here are some of the sources I consulted.